Hey everybody, I'm so excited about this video that I recorded it once without the microphone activated. Top job. Uh, first of all, apologies for the video title, although it's kind... Well, maybe it's accurate. Today I want to take you along a journey of how to make double wishbone suspensions for racing cars in the simulator. And double wishbone is the most commonly used sort of modern suspension system used on more advanced road cars, racing cars, most of them have it. It's not ideal, there is no ideal suspension system, it's just the least bad compromise that you can do. Here, uh, this is what I started with many years ago. Simply a graphic representation of a suspension with the tire in the frontal view, top view and a side view. And I can just pick all these mounting points and the suspension will change. So we change this, that made this lower link longer. We make it shorter again. It's just manually positioning all the points. And yeah, then what? It's very hard to judge what sort of properties this suspension will have because some of the key properties will be roll center height. What is that? Kind of like an anti-roll bar on the front. The higher the roll center is, the more roll stiffness you have on the front, the more it acts like you have more of an anti-roll bar or stiffer front suspension, sort of. So that's important to know. I don't know where the roll center is here, so that doesn't tell me anything. Caster angle, of course, is important. Uh, scrub radius is important. The trail uh, in the side view, because that gives you a lot of force feedback uh, consequences as well. If that's not the setup the way you need it. If it's incorrect, you can even have force feedback that inverts and that steers into the turn, for example. Uh, camber gain is very important. When the wheels move up in the suspension, do they get a lot of negative camber? Or like modern F1, they might actually get a bit of positive camber. So I have no information about some of those key properties. I just see the position of the links here, which is better than nothing. But I cannot judge this suspension if it does what I want it to do. So the next step, and I did this some years ago already, quite a few years ago, is to see if I can add some of these numbers that I need in order to you know, judge if this suspension does what I want to. So I did that. Here you can see I've added some lines and some numbers. So there are now dotted lines in the frontal view and in the side view. And here we suddenly have in interesting numbers like the caster, kingpin angle, scrub radius, the trail, roll center height, camber gain, anti-dive, anti-lift. And this is very helpful because you will see if I change a number, let's just say we change this number, you see, I changed this lower mounting point. We can now see, oh, that had, had an effect of changing the roll center height. It probably changed the camera gain, gain quite a bit. Yes. So here we see some of the consequences of what we did. You can also see, and that's the big problem. Look at my caster. Say I want this 7.6 degrees is great. And I also want that trail to be about four centimeters, but now I need a higher roll center. So what do I do? I change it, oh, change it like that. And now maybe my roll center is where I want it to be, but my caster is now one degree less and my trail is changed as well. So the problem of adjusting all these pickup points manually is that when you change one pickup point, you always tend to change more than one of these key properties of the suspension. So you're constantly tweaking a millimeter there. Oh, that messes that up, millimeter the other way. You're sort of balancing many mounting points to get the suspension char characteristics that you want. Very time consuming, kind of how I did it, because a lot of the time manufacturers, they do not give you the actual picker points. That's the easiest, you just copy paste the points. Although you have to make sure it's the wrong way around, not the wrong way around and adjust for the height. You have to, of course, pay attention. But if you do get the data for a car, and this is a little issue somewhere in a chart, something isn't, no, it's no longer existing and it complains. But if you have the data and you pay attention, you can copy it one-to-one. -one. Lots of times you do not have that. And so far my only option was to manually tweak all these positions until all these numbers matched. And still that gave me trouble, uh, but I will talk about that later. So wouldn't it be nice if there is a way that instead of tweaking all these numbers to arrive at these, I can enter these numbers and arrive at these. Huh? 
wouldn't that be nice? Well, actually, I kind of did that. I will explain how in a little bit of detail uh, later, but here is my new suspension generator, where these are my goals. So let's not have bump steer. Uh, well, let's just see. Uh, we have a rim vertical usage, so here we have the rim in a frontal view. Currently this lower ball joint is in the rim, that wouldn't fit. So the rim gives you an available vertical space to work with, and I can tell it how much of that to actually use. And if I use less than all of it, I can also move the mounting points up and down. In F1, for example, the mounting points are really high, uh, sort of between half of the rim and to the top of the rim. That's what I can set there. And furthermore, I can set my target, scrub radius, king ping, trail caster, camera gain, roll center height. I can tweak the length of the wishbones, set an anti-dive, anti-lift, bit of Ackerman, which is not it's tricky, won't get into that, and some bump steer. If I've set those numbers up, I can click this button, and it just made this suspension for me. And I have not got to worry about all these mounting points that all affect all the settings and are time consuming, easily spent half an hour making a suspension. I just spent one minute entering the numbers, clicked the button and generated it. So here all the things match. Caster 8 degrees, King Ping, all these things are now matching, which is great. And I only spent seconds on entering it. Of course, there's a lot of code running in the background to do it for me, but that's a one-time job and now it's much easier to make my suspension. So I'm really, really chuffed with, with this. And also the anti-dive here, 50%, yeah, we get 50%. So what does this allow me to do? Well, this is sort of maybe a GT car uh, suspension. Let's see if we can make a Formula One style uh, suspension where just quickly, so here uh, we have to offset the rim mounting points and use a bit more. Uh, it's 18 inch rim, that's the same, so I don't have to change that. What's the kingpin? I don't know. What's the trail? I don't know. The caster is probably more. Camber gain is about probably negative. Roll center height, I don't know, might be a bit high, I don't know. They've got long arms. And the upper arm is quite long as well. They have lots of anti-dive. Uh, well, and no bump steer. So I think these are Formula One style numbers, but I can judge that, so let's make it. Okay, that's a bit extreme. That's the problem. I meant to use less vertically. Let's do it now. Okay, this looks a bit more like it already. Uh, maybe I have to lower the roll center a little bit. Yeah, you see, this is already sort of looking. Maybe the roll center is more towards the ground. So now I've made a Formula One style suspension where you have those wishbones mounted really high and we still get all the entered numbers. A little bit more anti dive because there is a slight error in the calculations below that do the anti-dive. I think the code that runs off this is actually better, but it's still pretty close. Uh, so this is a Formula One style suspension with all the trail and camera gain and everything that I entered here. And I didn't have to spend one second worrying about the exact mounting points. So this is really cool. And maybe you think, well, these wishbones are a bit longer. Well, okay, maybe the lower arm length is a bit longer still. Now you will see this upper arm. I mean, sorry, the upper arm is will be a bit longer. Yep, there they go. <coughs> so very easy to do that. And maybe I'm looking at this and think, well, maybe the kingpin angle is a bit more, I don't know, 20. And you will see this point will be the same. So what happens is I think this point will move to the left and this will also move to the left slightly. See? It does that. So you can very easily, instead of messing with all these numbers, I can now very easily make a suspension and just sort of have a visual check if it's roughly what I want. And so this is, yeah, super, super nice. So this is all good and well, but maybe the more critical amongst you are thinking, well, Niels, this is all good and well, like I just said, uh, how does it behave in motion? So for this, I have to uh, thank my friend 
Andrea Quintarelli, which is very Italian, although he lives in Germany. So he's a, a race engineer. He no longer a race engineer. He's a normal car engineer now. And he made a spreadsheet a long time ago, shared it with me, where you can actually move the suspension and check the bump steer curves and stuff like that. Because bump steer is very important. When we have downforce and the car moves down, we want the front wheels to keep pointing forward instead of going cross-eyed or pointing outwards. Maybe there are cases where you want some bump steer, but overall you do not want that. Problem is, if we start messing with all these uh, picker points and we move the suspension, it is very hard to predict where do you have to mount the tow link, the steering rod, so that over the whole range of movement, we get almost no bump steer. And I found a way to sort of fix that, but in order to figure that out, I still had to have a spreadsheet that allowed me to articulate the suspension. So thanks to Andrea, uh, link to his blog below. He does some pretty interesting lap simulation uh, things with his homebrew lap simulation software. It's pretty cool, so definitely check that out. So we'll go to that spreadsheet now, which I modified a little bit. Spreadsheets can't help it. And um, explain you a bit more about how I go about equalizing the roll, uh, the, the bump steer, for example. So here's the spreadsheet made by Andrea. Did that sound Italian? I hope so. Uh, I modified a little bit to make some more plots. Here we can uh, sweep the ride heights from, in this case, 50 millimeters droop to 100 millimeters bump, which is sort of road car levels. Most racing cars see a lot less travel. And so I can test if my uh, generated picker points actually work. And what we are after is a very little bump steer. So here we go from zero right height change and we have 10 centimeters bump. We have minus, so that's toe out, uh, 0 0.07 degrees of toe out, which is very little. And bear in mind, this is at least twice the suspension movement you would see on a racing car. And in a road car, well, they are so soft and they have so much compliance that it doesn't really matter if you have like 0.1 degree of, of, of toe angle change. And if we drop the suspension, you can see that we get a little bit of a toe in 0 0.03 degrees. So this is not zero, but effectively it's almost zero. This barely has an effect. And I did this for many, many, many different suspensions. And this also gives you an idea, by the way, if the, how everything changes with suspension movement. So minus 50 wheels hanging down and here plus 100, lots of travel. You can see the caster angle changes a little bit, scrub radius changes a little bit, uh, roll center that migrates, typical consequence, very important actually, kingpin angle, everything changes. Um, this is very useful. And I had to use something like this in order to verify that my calculations work because you do not want this toe angle to be like one degree at 50 millimeters. That's too much. So what I did is try to figure out what sort of consequence I get, because if I change like the anti-dive of a suspension, I would see the bump steer go bad. And if I had anti-lift, it would go bad the other way. If I had more camber gain, it would not be zero bump steer anymore. So I tried to look for relationships between the anti-dive, the camber gain, the roll center height, the length of the lower and upper arms to see how changing those affected my bump steer curve. And I fudged really, I do not even understand the code anymore. I found relationships and I tried to compensate. And what that means is I changed the mounting point of the steering arm, the toe link on the chassis side. If I see some bump steer, move it up or down a little bit to compensate for the bump steer. And what you see here, um, nine times three, 27 suspensions. Uh, well, actually three suspensions a GT formula and an LMP suspension-ish at nine combinations of uh, anti-lift and anti-dive and then run through that minus 50 to plus 100 millimeter travel. So that's way more travel than you ever see. Plus a target bump steer, which I've also implemented. So one suspension had a target bump steer of zero and you can see that all the nine configurations of anti-lift, anti-dive, 100%, uh, 50%, near 0%, nine combinations of anti give me effectively less than 0.1 degree of toe change. 
uh, with the target being zero, we get zero. Then I had another suspension with the target of about half a degree of bump steer with 100 millimeters. And you can see it underreaches a little bit, but it sort of is on that slope here. So you can also see it's fairly close. Nine combinations of this single seater suspension in this case, with all sorts of different anti-dive and anti-lift, we still get very close to our target of 0.5 degrees. And if I turn that off, I make it the target zero, these angled lines will hopefully, let me run the code, join the flat ones. Boom. Excellent. So the target bump steer has changed. Now maybe I want the other suspension, which has a target of one degree of bump steer for 100 millimeters. It's still, it underreaches a little bit, but here it's on the correct slope. Uh, so I set the bump steer to be the angle of the line around zero. So if you continue that, we are probably even a bit more than one degree. So because the geometry changes as the suspension moves, my bump steer gain will also change a little bit, but it's mostly there. So maybe I want to zero that as well. So we, now we are looking at 27 suspensions, very different, three different main suspensions with each having nine different anti settings with a goal of having zero bump steer, except for, okay, there's one outlier here. Uh, most of them stay within 0.1 degree of bump steer at 100 millimeters of bump travel. There's one outlier. Maybe I can fix that by adding more fudgy code, but this is pretty, pretty good, I would say, and means the code I made is quite reliable in eliminating bump steer. And since it is good at eliminating bump steer, I then added some code that set a target bump steer, if it's almost zero to begin with, and maybe things like a Porsche Cup rear suspension has a bit of bump toe in, well, maybe you, you can implement that. So now I've added a bit on one suspension. Oops, 10 times. Boom. See, now I have these suspensions made with, with more bump steer. So by running all sorts of suspensions through Andrea's uh, sheet and checking my bump steer, I could correct without iteration. That's no iteration in this code. It's all predicting. Uh, iteration would mean you just run your suspension code, you check this bump steer curve, and if it's not your target, if it's not zero, let's make it flat again. So you would see, oh, this one here has a bit of uh, rebound toe in and bump toe out. If you iterate, you run that code that generates these curves, and then you just tweak the steering arm position a little bit, you run it again, check if it's, if it's improved. And then depending on how smart you set up your iteration code, you can get zero bump steer with 10 iterations. There's nothing wrong with that. Probably even smarter and more accurate to do it uh, that way. But that means you have to have that understand actually the code that does the full articulation. And I'll be very honest with you. I do not understand how to do the maths of moving uh, the suspension in 3D. It's a bit too complicated for me, so it was also a challenge to see if I can predict the bump steer and correct for it. But so there's no iteration happening in my code. It's all predicting trends based on what I saw generating a bunch of suspensions. But I'm rambling at this point. I'm really, really pleased that we've come to the point where with just a click of a button, I can make a geometry that is uh, almost free of bump steer and has all the target specifications that I want. So maybe sort of tooting my own horn with this video, but maybe you found it interesting to, uh, to uh, hear a bit more about how you go about doing this. And I've made my life a lot easier right at the moment where I don't really make much many vehicles anymore in the sim, but this will transfer whatever brings, uh, whatever comes along uh, on my path in the future with sim development. I can make suspensions quick and easy now, even if it's for a hundred cars, just enter these numbers. Don't have to worry about all these. So I'm very happy, very excited. And uh, maybe you found this video interesting. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.